So our topic this afternoon is Islam and the nations, not Israel and the nations, Islam and the nations. We get to Israel uh, tomorrow, God willing. So what do we mean by Islam? Oh, Islam is a religion of peace. We're just talking about a few fanatics and extremists lie. That's the popular lie promoted by President Bush. He should know better than that. Uh, the UN, the EU, they keep saying, here's what they say, well, not every Muslim is a terrorist, but they don't tell you that nearly every terrorist is a Muslim. And that is a fact. I may have mentioned, some of you may have heard, I was being interviewed on a secular radio in Washington, D.C. And that was how the talk show host began. Well, Mr. Hunt, what do you think about extremist Islam? I said, first of all, I object to the word extremist. These people are not extremists. They are real Muslims. They are practicing Islam the way it is. And well, they had a Muslim waiting for me in the wings. And uh, he comes out and he says, well, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm a Muslim. I was raised in Islam. And I can tell you, Islam is peace. Well, I said, that, that's interesting. Uh, maybe you could give us one example where Islam ever brought peace. Silence. <laughs> <clears throat> there isn't any. Well, you know, Islam means submission. That's the only peace they bring. You remember Arafat said, peace for us is the destruction of Israel. Well, I said, I can give you dozens of examples proving that Islam is war, not peace. Um, what about, what, what was that eight-year war uh, there between Iran and Iraq? Aren't they both Islamic countries? In fact, the majority in Iraq are, are Shiites, as, as are the majority in, in Iran. Eight-year war. They used a thousand tons of poison gas on one another. They, they killed as many as in World War I. That was Muslim against Muslim. Was that peace? What about the Gulf War? We're pagans. Saudi Arabia called us over there to bring peace. Who was attacking them? Another Muslim, a nation. What about the warlords in, in, in Afghanistan? Are they not all Muslims? Hasn't Islam been in Afghanistan for many centuries? Why hasn't Islam brought peace yet in Afghanistan or anyone else? I said, what about the 15-year war, uh, civil war in, Al in Algeria? Well, they've killed more than 100,000. This is Muslim against Muslim. 15 of the 19 northern states in Nigeria adopted Sharia, Islamic law. What has been the result? They burned down hundreds of churches and killed thousands of Christians. What about the Indonesia, largest Muslim country in the world? What have they done there? Well, they've killed thousands of Christians and they have burned down about 6,000 churches. Is this peace? The Sudan, in Sudan, the government in Khartoum adopted Sharia. What has been the result? They've killed about two million in South Sudan, tortured, murdered, uh, sold into slavery. There is an active slave market in the Muslim world today. Qaddafi uh, buys them for $15 a piece. This is the history of Islam from the very beginning. This is not something that developed lately. Muhammad began his career attacking caravans, villages. He robbed, murdered. Uh, you, uh, you can Google all of this on, on the internet in uh, 631 when Muhammad died. You understand why he died, how he died? It wasn't a heroic death. It wasn't, he died, didn't die as a martyr. He was poisoned by the widow of a man he had murdered. 
That's how Muhammad died. When Muhammad died, what happened? Well, Muhammad had said, whoever apostatizes, kill him. They still do it. What's, what's the rule in Saudi Arabia today? By the way, if you want to know what Islam is, go to Saudi Arabia. No Jew can set foot in Saudi Arabia. Well, they wouldn't want to. They would be killed. Uh, when we went, went to war, the Gulf War, to rescue uh, these Muslims, killing one another, we had a great concern. Well, first of all, Saudi Arabia said, you will not bring any Jews into our country. The United States at least had the courage to say, these men are part of our units. They have trained with our units. They're an integral part of our military. And we will bring them in. You better look the other way. But then we thought, wait a minute. Dog tag says Jew. If, they fall, if a Jew falls a prisoner of an Iraqi, they will skin them alive. So we wanted to change the dog tag. Uh, what are we going to call them? Well, they're not Baptists, <laughs> Presbyterians. <laughs> Not exactly Protestants. So they came up with a new classification, Protestant B. <laughs> and that was what the dog tags of the Jewish military men read. Well, this is, this is where it began. Uh, Arabia, Saudi Arabia. No Jew can set foot. You must be a Muslim to be a citizen of Saudi Arabia. You cannot build a non-Muslim place of worship. Saudi Arabia. Um, Muhammad said, whoever apostatizes, off with his head. They behead them. And those of you that haven't read, uh, I've got a copy of it here, haven't read Judgment Day, we give you the statistics on the beheadings today in a place they call Chop Chop Square. Now, that's not, I'm not being funny. That's what, they, that's what they call it. So if a Muslim converts to any other religion, not just Christianity, any other religion, off with his head. This is the official law. You understand that? That's well, a religion of peace, of course. I often, I often say it sure is a good thing that Islam is a peaceful religion, or we could really have some problems <laughs> over, over there in the Middle East. <clears throat> now, when Muhammad died, poisoned by the widow of a man he'd murdered, he had forced Islam upon the Arabians. Almost no one else, uh, only Arabians. This is an Arab religion, you understand. And uh, the Arabs, the Arabians, thought they were free. Their oppressor, who had forced them into this at the point of a sword, he died. Now we can leave this, uh, this horrible religion. Well, Muhammad had said, anybody turns from Islam, you kill him. So. Abu Bakr, who was Muhammad's father-in-law, the father of Muhammad's favorite wife, Aisha, uh, to whom he was betrothed at the age of six, consummated the marriage at the age of nine, a lot of hanky-panky in between. A nice man. Uh, <coughs> with the loyal Muslims, they fought what is called the wars of apostasy. You understand why they're called that? These people had apostatized. These are the wars of apostasy to bring the apostates back into Islam, they killed about 70,000. These are all Arabs, former Muslims, killed by the Muslims. This is what Islam is from the very beginning. Terrorists are extremists? No. Now they probably they want to kill me for this. But by any definition of today, Muhammad was a terrorist. He terrorized villages. He terrorized caravans coming by. He terrorized Arabia to force people into Islam. That's how they converted the world. So Islam spread from there up into uh, last uh, summer, my wife and I, yeah, where we finished part of the book, Yogi and the Body of Christ on the phone. We were in uh, uh, Tour Poitiers, two towns. That was the final. Where, where the Muslims were turned back. This is getting court towards Paris, 732 AD. Hadn't been turned back in Vienna, we'd all be speaking Arabic today. They were turned back. 
but they went all the way from France to China. The takeover of India, read, read the historians. It is called the bloodiest story in history. They killed more in India than Hitler killed. That was just in India. You have all heard of the Taj Mahal. Not too many of you probably know it was built by a Muslim mogul with 20,000 slave laborers, and he slaughtered thousands. This is the history of Islam, okay? It has been terrorism and murder from the very beginning. Now, the first four caliphs who succeeded Muhammad, they were called the rightly guided caliphs. What happened to them? Three of the four were murdered by fellow Muslims. I won't go into the details of those, but um, Ali was the final one, the fourth one, and uh, he had to fight rival Muslims to retain his power. He fought a number of battles, two of them I'll mention. The Battle of the Camel, 12,000 Muslims killed by Muslims. The Battle of Siphon, thousands more were killed, but he finally was murdered by a fellow Muslim. This is a peaceful religion. I'm trying to convince you of that, which they're trying to do now. They're trying to prove to us that Islam is a peaceful religion by fighting one another, uh, Shiites against Sunnis. Now, here's the way it works. And this happens in Pakistan. You, you don't read of it too often. Here's a Shiite suicide bomber goes into a Sunni mosque, blows himself up. Well, the Shiites say he got instant entrance to paradise. The Sunnis say, no, he went to hell. Now, the Sunnis go into a Shiite mosque and they blow themselves up. And the Sunnis say, oh, he got instant entrance into paradise. But the Shiites say, no, he went to hell. Okay, there's a little bit of confusion there, but it's a very peaceful religion, you understand. And this is why President Bush keeps drumming this into us. These are extremists. Oh, this is a peaceful religion. Please, they are not extremists. They are Muslims. This is what Islam is. You understand that? <laughs> now, what we need from you folks, get this book into your library. People need to read it. Put two or three copies in there. Uh, talk to people, write letters to the editor. Now, it may not do much good. Uh, we had so many lies in our Bend Bulletin. Well, I, don't, I can say anything I want because they wouldn't have me again anyway. Uh, uh, but uh, the Bend Bulletin had full page. Uh, these were reprints of articles in uh, the Sacramento Bee. Lies about Islam. You can write a letter to the editor. I've had a number of letters to the editor published. I wrote a letter. You've got to stick with it. I think it's 250 words and so forth. And uh, I just simply gave them, gave them the truth about Islam. Would they publish it? No. I called the editor, uh, well, whoever was in charge of this, on the phone. I discussed it with him. Look, I said, I'm... <coughs> Amazon.com claims they have 40 of my titles. There are about 40 or 50 languages around the world. I'm a recognized author, and I can't even get a 250-word letter quoted in my local newspaper? We got a problem. They will not print the truth. Now, somehow, we've got to get this out there. Now, you understand, those who remain loyal to Ali, those are the Shiites, and you can see the fruit of that. Uh, to this day. If we, here's your job. We talk about tomorrow afternoon, where do we go from here? If we could get 100,000 letters to swamp the White House telling him the truth. Now, I'll surprise you. Rick Warren, he put the, the manuscript of this book in the President Bush's hand, in President Bush's hands personally. They're close friends. I haven't heard a peep out of President Bush, and he still continues to give us this line. Well, that's what we call politically correct. And that very phrase tells you a lot about politics, why we don't respect politicians. 
Now, let me, um, I want to just read a little bit from here, a bit of the history. All of these rightly guided, and three of the four were, were killed, murdered, uh, by fellow Muslims. Within a few years after Muhammad's murder, more than 100,000 Muslims had been killed by fellow Muslims, either in battle or by murder. These were his staunchest disciples, his closest companions, and they fought one another for his wealth and power. Battles raged over who would be the next leader of the growing but fiercely divided peaceful religion of Islam. Imagine the apostles of Jesus fighting one another, killing one another, fighting for power. Well, this is the bloodiest empire in history. It was the fastest growing, the, the largest, all the way to China. Uh, and, well, I'll just read you a little bit. of it. In 712, Muslim raiders under Muhammad Qasim began the invasion of India, demolishing temples and palaces, massacring entire cities. As in Constantinople, where the streets would one day run with blood, the slaughter went on for three days in India's port city of Dibal. The massacres perpetrated by Muslims in India are unparalleled in history, bigger in sheer numbers than the Holocaust, which I, I mentioned. Muslim conquests involving multiple massacres of literally millions continued for more than 1,300 years. And then I name some of the uh, dynasties. Caesarea surrendered under agreement at that its 2,000 knights would be spared. Once disarmed, they were massacred, like the Jews of Yathrib. You understand Medina originally was called Yathrib. It was a city that was founded by Jews. Well, Muhammad comes with his troops, he besieges, he's too strong for them, and he promises them safe conduct if they will surrender, turn over their arms. When they do that, what does he do? Beheads them. They're buried under the marketplace in Medina to this day. This is called the city of the prophet. They changed it from Yathrib to Medina. In Spain, where Islam was said to be the most humane, the garrison was, was slaughtered in 920, Pamplona was put to the sword in 923, then followed Cordova, Zaragoza, and Mereda, with all adult males killed, women and children enslaved. The Jews of Granada were butchered in 1066, 34 years after 6,000 Jews had been slaughtered in Fez, Morocco. In 1146, Islamic Fez was decimated by another faction of Muslims, the Almohads, who conquered much of North Africa. After annihilating the Almoravides, also Muslims, with about 100,000 massacred there and another 120,000 killed in Marrakesh. Similar blood baths of Muslims against Muslim continued. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. You can't find one example in history where Islam ever brought peace anywhere to any people. I'm talking about the 400 year rule, the Ottoman Turks and, and so forth. And uh, this is horrific reading but now I want to come to the destruction of Christian Smyrna. And you understand when we say Christian, these are nominal Christians. They're not born again evangelicals by any means, most of them. In September 1922, Mustafa Kemal's, that's Ataturk's deliberate massacre of some 200,000 Armenian and Greek inhabitants. This is just in Smyrna, one of the seven uh, uh, churches of Asia. It becomes even more despicable when we realize that English, American, Italian, and French battleships anchored in the harbor repelled fleeing victims who swarmed out to them for help. The whole place, except for the Muslim quarter, is aflame. They're being slaughtered. And they, try, they run to the dock, they swim out. American warships wouldn't take them aboard, would not rescue one. That's politically correct, you understand. We didn't want to upset our relationship with Turkey. Uh, we didn't want to offend them. Now, there's a must-read book. It's called The Blight of Asia. Get it if you can. George Horton, U.S. Consul in that doomed city and eyewitness to the unspeakable cruelty of Islam and Western complicity writes, quote, one of the keenest impressions which I brought away with me from Smyrna 
was a feeling of shame that I belonged to the human race. You need to read that man's book. In, the, in its foreword, James W. Gerard, former U.S. ambassador to Germany, describes Horton's book as, quote, the whole story of the savage extermination of Christian civilization by Muslims throughout the length and breadth of the old Byzantine Empire. Horton himself writes, this process of extermination was carried on over a considerable period of time with fixed purpose, with system, with painstaking minute details, and it was accomplished with unspeakable cruelties, causing the destruction of a greater number of human beings than have suffered in any other similar persecution since the coming of Christ. Yet Islam continues to masquerade as a religion of peace, and we go right along with this lie. And I get really angry. And I would hope that some of you would do something about this. Uh, write about it to your local newspaper. Or call some people, do something. I want to awaken and anger you to rise up and do something about this lie that's in the medium. These are fanatics. No, they're not fanatics. These are real Muslims. And I can tell you, you, you go to, look, you, you can seem to be a peaceful Muslim in America, but let Islam take over America, which they intend to do. I was speaking in, in uh, England. Uh, I was in a city that was 75% Muslim. Muslim mayor, of course. People are moving out. They boast that city would be 100% Muslim. And they're going to have a string of cities in a, in a crescent shape across England, all 100% Muslim. And they're going to adopt Sharia, Islamic law. Now, this is their intention. They were turned back at the gates of Vienna. They were turned back at Poitiers, Tour Poitiers. But now they have a more effective invasion. It's not a frontal assault. It's an invasion of immigrants. And our, the United States is letting them in by the thousands. Since 9-1-1, we've let in more than 50,000 young Muslim men of fighting age. How could we possibly be so Id idiots, such idiots? Uh, it makes no sense. But I, I want you to do something about it. I hope you will. So here we are today. Now, what's this all about over there? Well, turn to Genesis chapter 11. See, when you read, when you read the Bible, this is not the Bhagavad Gita, folks. This is not the Book of Mormon, just pure lies, fiction. This is the word of the living God. And you are reading about not only prophecy, but you're reading history. These are real people. You read about the Hittites and Perizzites and Jebusites and Amorites and Canaanites and so forth. They really lived. And you read of true events. Well, here is Genesis 11, verse 31. Terah took Abram and so forth. And they went forth, just skip down the middle of the verse, they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Palestine. Is that what your Bible says? Oh, 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 wait a minute. There's no Palestine? Surprise, surprise, there was no such place. Uh, this is the land of Canaan, all right? Go over to verse five of the next chapter. They, it, they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Now, Verse 6, the Canaanite was then in the land, and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. All right? Think, please think. The Arabs today claim to be the descendants of Abraham through Ishmael. Now, Ishmael was the firstborn, of course, but he was an illegitimate son. Well, they say, it doesn't matter. He still was the firstborn, and he gets the, the, the land. He, get, he inherits the promises. And we have a problem in the Middle East today because there is a people who call themselves Palestinians, 
and they claim to be descended from the original Palestinians. And they say, we were here first, and those Jews are occupying our land. You hear about the occupied territories? No, well, they're occupying Jewish land. They've got it backwards. All right, well, so you're, you're descended from Ishmael, uh, and you're descended from the original Palestinians. Who was Ishmael's father? Abraham. What was his nationality? Well, not yet. <laughs> He was a Chaldean, we just read it. It said they went forth from Ur of the Chaldees, right? So Abraham was a Chaldean. Who was Ishmael's mother? Hagar, what was her nationality? Egyptian. So you've got an Egyptian mother, you've got a Chaldean father, and when they arrive in this land called Canaan, it's already settled by Canaanites. And you dare to say, that you are descended from the original Palestinians, you are lying. Maybe you're ignorant. You heard that over and over. It is not true, okay? Now, if you've read Judgment Day, you know. Um, wh when did this land of Israel become Palestine? 130 AD, the simple history, Google it, go on the internet. You don't even have to go to a library anymore. Uh, 130 AD, the Romans who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD began to rebuild it as a city dedicated to Jupiter. 132 AD, they began to build a temple to Jupiter on Temple Mount. You think that upset the Jews? Of course it upset them. There was an uprising was successful at first, but the Romans brought in more legions. About a thousand, this is just history, a thousand Jewish villages were killed, uh, were, were, were destroyed. They killed about 500,000 Jews. Thousands more sold into slavery. And in anger, uh, the Romans renamed Israel. It was Israel up until 135 AD. The Romans renamed it Provincia Syria Palestina. And from that time on, everyone living there was called a Palestinian. Who lived there? Palest who lived there? Jews. You chase them out, they come back. This is our land. God gave it to us. Jews were called Palestinians. Ask the general. I don't know whether he will mention this when he gets. He was part of a volunteer brigade in the British Army called the Palestinian Brigade. How many Arabs were in the Palestinian Brigade? Zero. They were all fighting on Hitler's side. The Palestinian Brigade was all Jews, okay? They were known as Palestinians. You had the Palestinian Symphony Orchestra, Palestinian Post. Uh, these were a Jew Jewish orchestra, a, 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 a Jewish symphony, a, a Jewish newspaper. I quote, and I don't think I can find it because I didn't write this down in any notes, so I won't even bother to try, but um, I can quote it well enough. Um, I quote a gentleman, gentleman named Ahmed Shukari. Now, if you read this, you ought to know, know this, but anyway, uh, Ahmed Shukari. He was a, an Arab leader. In 1956, Ahmed Shukari, an Arab leader in the Middle East, testified to the United Nations, there is no such place as Palestine. That's a Zionist invention. We Arabs are not Palestinians. If there's any Palestinians, it's those Jews. Eight years later, 1964, Ahmed Shukari became the founding chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization. And they began to say, oh no, no, we are the Palestinians. We're descended from the original Palestinians. And these Jews are Johnny come lately, and they're occupying our land. And the world accepts it, and it becomes the basis for Condoleezza Rice to do some nice things over there. Get out of Gaza, you Jews. Yeah, next comes the West Bank. Um, now, if we went to, well, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself because I'm going to talk about that. When, well, we are talking about the nations, so <laughs> let's, let's say that. Let's go to Joel chapter 3. You know, the Bible, you want to you prove the Bible? I can tell you, I sit next to uh, 
I sit next to CEOs, chief executive officer of multinational corporations. Um, uh, United Airlines puts me in first class because I fly so much. Uh, and they try to treat me right, which they, they really do. I sit next to Harvard University professors, scientists, and, and so forth. I was sitting next to uh, uh, one of the scientists from the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. And well, the Lord puts me there, so what am I gonna do? And uh, I, I had a little fun with him. And uh, I said, you know, we're really concerned about that, I didn't call it sacred owl, but we're really concerned about that spotted owl here in Oregon and endangered species. And he said, yeah, we ought to be. And I said, I, you know, I just can't understand that. Endangered species? I thought that was how evolution worked. <laughs> Well, I can tell you, when I, when I begin to, look, everybody knows what's going on in the Middle East. I'm telling you how to witness to people now. They know what's going on in the Middle East. And when I tell them, I can show you in the Bible. It tells you what would happen. It's describing what's going on in the Middle East today. It tells you why it's happening, and it tells you what the outcome is going to be. I don't care how large a multinational corporation he's the CEO of. He sits up, really? Well, that's interesting. Uh, now, look at this. You try to tell me this, I know none of you would, but get somebody who will try to say it's not about what's happening today. Verse three, Joel, I'm sorry, verse two, Joel three, verse two. I, as God speaking, will also gather all nations. Now, people ask me, is Australia? I'm speaking in Australia. Is Australia in Bible prophecy? Yeah, we just read it. Is the, is the United States in Bible prophecy? Yeah, we just read it. All nations. I think I'm just so dumb that when the Bible says all nations, I think it means all nations. <laughs> I don't think it's more complicated than that. Uh, I will gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Um, Shimon or Randy can tell you where that is, right next to Jerusalem, and will plead with them there for my people. Means he's going to punish them. He gives you two reasons. For my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. That's number one. Well, it's been going on for centuries, but it is still going on today. Now, what does that represent? Anti-Semitism. You know, it's not complicated, folks. It's very simple. What is anti-Semitism? It is satanic. I can back that up with scripture and simple logic. Uh, Muhammad said, the last day will not come until the Muslims confront the Jews and the Muslims destroy them. In that day, the rocks and the trees will cry, Allah will give the rocks and the trees a voice and they will cry out, O Muslim, O Abdullah, O servant of Allah, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. You understand, I'm not making this up. The foundational doctrine of Islam is every Jew must be killed on the face of this earth before any Muslim can be resurrected. Last day will come till we, we've got to kill them all. What's the last day? I'm not talking about the last days. Uh, it's talking about a particular day, the last day. When is that? When Muslims get resurrected. What happens when they get resurrected? Well, their good deeds are weighed against their bad deeds to see whether they will make it to paradise. I'm sorry, that's stupidity. Uh, I mean, we might as well say it like it is. What is the point? But a lot of Catholics believe that. Well, I, I haven't been so bad. I've done more good than I have evil. Yeah, well, okay, you stand in front of the judge and you say, yeah, I recognize I was speeding the other day, but I've driven more times within the speed limit than I have exceeding it. <laughs> Wouldn't that, I'll, well, I did kill a guy uh, uh, the other day, but two days later, I saved the lives of two people from drowning. Now that's two to one. Uh, 
Is this stupidity? I'm sorry. My wife tells me, watch your language. Um, <laughs> but it's very difficult to say it in any, with any less emphasis. You don't stand before God. You're a sinner. It only takes one sin to sin. And you say, well, yeah, but I've done more good than I have. Yeah, you don't know God's standard. You haven't done any good, probably, by God's standard. So this is Islam. Every, I'm telling you the truth. Every Jew must be killed before any Muslim can be resurrected to find out whether the good deeds outweigh the bad. Muhammad also said, Allah has commanded me to fight against all people until all people confess there's no God but Allah, Muhammad is his prophet. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasul Allah, if you speak Arabic, which I don't. Um, but that's, that's the same thing in Arabic. Everyone in the world must submit to Islam. This is what Islam is about. This is what they want to do in America. They determined to do it in England. If you want to read a shocking book, get Londonistan, like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Londonistan by a secular writer. She just tells you the truth. Well, first of all, if I went back to Joel, well, get on to the next part of it. But London is the terrorist center of the world. And even Egypt complains. Even Muslims, Saudi Arabia complains about how the British are coddling the terrorists. They're reaping what they sowed. This is their goal, believe me, it's in all of their literature. Ahmad Najad is not the first one to say Israel must be wiped off the map. That is some kind of a joke, is it? Well, they, they, I challenge you, try to find a Muslim map or an Arab map that even shows Israel. Israel has already been wiped off the map. They're not in any map. Let me quote you what I'm going to keep your Bible in Joel 3. I'm going to quote you what they said back in 67. My wife and I, with our four young children, were there in 1967. We were in Egypt. We were in the Middle East, and we had some real adventures. By God's grace, he brought us out of them and got us into Turkey just before the war broke out. But to Egypt's National Assembly, March 26, 1964, Gamal al-Nasser declared, the problem is the very existence of Israel. You understand? Oh, give us a little more land. No, it's the very existence of Israel. March 8, he boasted, we will enter Palestine with its soil saturated in blood. We aim at the eradication of Israel. May 22nd, Egypt closed the Straits of Tehran to all Israeli shipping. Uh, well, on May 20th, the Syrian defense minister boasted, our forces are now entirely ready to explode the Zionist presence in the, in the Arab homeland to enter into a battle of annihilation. Nasser threatened May 27th. We were over there. Our basic objective will be the destruction of Israel. We will not accept any coexistence with land. Now, do you understand how ludicrous it is? Well, no, no, wait a minute. If you... If, if, um, uh, well, Israel, you know, has taken land. And if they would just give it back and get back to the 1967 borders, well, that was the 1948 borders, where the UN gave Israel a narrow strip of land, it was indefensible. Um, did the, were the Arabs satisfied? The entire Arab delegation to the UN walked out. They said, this means war, we will annihilate them, okay? Oh, but if we could just go back to what the UN first gave us, well, we'd be happy with that. You weren't happy then. Why would you be happy now? You are lying. You just want to do anything to get a little more land, a little more land, to whittle Israel down to something that they cannot possibly defend. That's your purpose. That's your goal. It hasn't changed. Israel must be exterminated. Why is that? Well, anti-Semitism is very simple. As soon as the serpent in the garden heard the... the the seed of the woman is going to deal you the death blow. He's going to bruise your head. He's going to deal you the death blow. 
Uh, now Satan is brilliant. He's also stupid. He's a self-deluded egomaniac. But he knows he's going to watch for that virgin-born son and he's going to kill him. He has to. If he could kill the Messiah, then he's won his battle with God. Well, you know, go down through history. Athaliah, Athaliah and, and, and Haman and uh, Herod and so forth. Well, as a matter of fact, Satan was not able to destroy the Messiah. He died on the cross. And I think Satan was very confused uh, because at one point uh, he has Peter say, no, you're not going to die on the cross. And then he has Judas betray him so he would die on the cross. Satan does not understand redemption. Uh, he certainly did not at that, at that time. But Christ defeated Satan on the cross. Is that the end of the battle? No. Please think. It's very simple. The Bible has what? Hundreds and hundreds of promises that God said, although these people, they're under God's judgment, but they're also under his protection. That he would, they will be hated and persecuted and killed like no other people, but he would preserve them. A remnant would be preserved, an identifiable ethnic group of people. He would bring them back into the promised land, and there the Messiah would return to rule over them on the throne of his father David. Simple fact. No Jews. Israel's been replaced by the church. Israel's been wiped out by the Muslims. No second coming. Are you understanding? I'm not talking about the rapture. We've been raptured. We're safe in heaven. But Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, cannot come back to rule over Israel on the throne of his father David if there's no Israel. You got it? That's what this is all about in the Middle East. Okay? And we are helping Islam in that. Get out of Gaza. Get out of the West Bank. Now, let's go down a little further in this verse. They scattered my people among the nations and they parted my land. Now, Israel has been conquered by many uh, by many nations down through history. The last, the Ottoman Turkish Empire. They held the Middle East for 400 years. Did any conqueror ever divide the land? Never. Never. Why would a conqueror divide the land? You keep it for yourself, right? Who would you give it to? Who would you give part of it to? First time in history, the land of Israel has been divided exactly as the Bible says. The British, they were the instigators to begin with. You remember? I want to ask you to remember all these things. The Balfour Declaration of 1917, Paris Peace Conference 1919, Declaration of Principles by the League of Nations predecessor of the UN in 1922. The whole world recognized this place called Palestine belonged to the Jews. It was set aside by the nations of the world to be the national homeland of the Jewish people scattered all over. Britain was given the mandate to welcome them there. And what did Britain do? Betrayed the Jews. They kept Jews out. Holocaust survivors in half sinking ships within sight of the promised land, driven back by the British Navy, put into camps. 1944, Hitler hadn't yet invaded Hungary. 500,000 Hungarian Jews untouched by the Nazis. Hitler wanted to sell them for $2 a piece. $1 million, you could have saved 500,000 Jews from the ovens. No one would take them, and that includes the United States. Well, we'll talk more about that uh, tomorrow morning. Nations. America. America betrayed Israel multiple times. The State Department of the United States has been opposed to Israel from the very beginning for oil, okay? Well, what does God say? They divided my land. What? Israel, UN Resolution 181, November 29, 1947. It's called the partition of the land. Look it up, Google it. The nations of the world united to divide this land that belonged to Israel. Israel ended up with about 13% of what it had been promised. And God is angry with the nations of this world. 
We're talking about Islam, we're going to get judgment from God, and the nations are going to be punished by God. And what is the basis of every peace proposal since, including President Bush's roadmap to peace? Israel, give them a little more land. Give them a little more land. Oh, you're occupying Arab, Arab land. Give them a little more land, Israel. Give them a little more land. You divided my land, God says, and I am going to punish you. The nations of this world are defying the God of heaven. By the way, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Twelve times, it says. He's the God of Israel. Two hundred and three times, it says. I don't know who you are. I presume most of you are really uh, straight with the Lord. But if you don't like Jews, you don't like Israel, and you don't want to know the God of Israel, you do not know the true God. Because if you're going to know God, you're going to know him as the God of Israel. And there are many reasons for that. Why are these Jews so important? Well, without the Jews, there wouldn't be any Jesus. He's a Jew. Uh, the Messiah doesn't just step off of a UFO and say, voila, here I am. Uh, no, he comes with a pedigree. He comes with prophecies fulfilled. He comes with a history. He comes with an ancestry. You cannot deny it. You would have to know who the Messiah would be. So why are the Israel, Israel why is Israel and why are the Jews so special? Three times God calls them the apple of his eye. Deuteronomy 32.10, Lamentations 3.18, Zechariah 2.8. 203 times, as I said, the God of Israel. Jesus in John 17.3 said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And if you're going to know the only true God, you must, in order to have life eternal, and you reject him as the God of Israel, I'm sorry. What, what does he say in Exodus chapter 3 to Moses? Moses says, what's your name? Who will I say is sending me? You tell him, I am. I am. Jehovah hath sent you. This is my name, and this is my memorial unto all generations. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. A lot of reasons for that. We don't have time to go into it. 70% of the pages of this book are about Israel. Wow. Must be a pretty important topic, and there are many churches who won't even talk about Israel. Many of them say, oh, Israel's been replaced by the church. You understand, God has gone out. I'm just reasoning with you. God says, come now, let's reason together. God has gone out on a limb, way out to the end, when he calls himself 203 times, I am the God of Israel. Imagine the embarrassment to the God of heaven if Israel doesn't exist. You call yourself the God of Israel. You weren't able to preserve them. They don't even exist anymore. Now you understand what that means. God is a liar. Hundreds, hundreds, I hope you know them, read them. Hundreds of promises that God said he would preserve these people. He would bring them back into their land. The Messiah would return to rule over them on the throne of his father, David. Now, all the nations are guilty. Now, the Bible tells us it's pointed out a man wants to die. We talked about that this morning. After this, the judgment. But you don't have to die. The nations are not going to stand before the great white throne judgment. Individuals stand there. But nations are going to be punished in this life. A lot of them no longer exist. Britain, because of its betrayal of the, of the Jews in the 20s and 30s, lost its empire. The sun used to never set on the British Empire. Britannia ruled the waves no more. Egypt, I was talking to the general about this. It's a base country. I don't want to offend any Egyptians here, but it's a base country. God said it would be. It's not a major power. Uh, it never will be again. But God is going to rescue uh, Egyptians. He loves them. Christ died for them. Now, all the nations 
Islam and the nations we're talking about, they are all guilty before God. Anti-Semitism, what Hitler did, he couldn't do that alone. You understand the Germans were behind this? You can't say, this, this t city over here is going to be Judenfrei, it's going to be free of Jews. No Jews can enter. No Jews can be university professors. No Jews can be lawyers or doctors. You can't do that without the consent of the, of the German people. You can't force that on them. It took centuries of preparation by the Roman Catholic Church. More than 100 anti-Semitic documents put out by the Roman Catholic Church. You know the popes were the first ones to put the Jews in ghettos. Made them wear a yellow hat or a badge. Hitler said to, to uh, Catholic leaders in the early 30s, I am only doing what your church has done for 1,500 years. Only I'm going to finish the job. Uh, the whole world uh, is, is, is guilty, not just Hitler. And we document that for you. Now, let me, let me just read a couple of things here. We got a little bit of time, I think. Um, page 39, I talk about State Department Telegram number 354. It shut down the secret channels of communication with the informants and indicated that further information about the extermination of Jews was of no interest and should not be accepted in diplomatic channels. America didn't even want to hear. President Roosevelt uh, called a conference of 32 nations, the Hotel Royale in Evian, France, on the shores of Lake Geneva. Delegates from 32 countries gathered there to discuss the worsening plight of the Jews. President Roosevelt had already said, we're not gonna do anything about it. The whole world knew that the Jews were being slaughtered. What are we gonna do? Nothing. Now Hitler mocked them. When the conference uh, began, Hitler shrewdly declared, I'm quoting him, I can only hope that the other world, which has such deep sympathy with these criminals, that's the Jews, will at least be generous enough to convert this sympathy into practical aid. We, on our part, are ready to put all these criminals at the disposal of these countries for all I care, even on luxury ships. Understand? Hitler said, you can have them. Oh, you, you, you think that you don't like what we're doing? You can have them. We'll give them to you. We'll send them on luxury ships. 1943, American and British officials met in Bermuda. Well, at the, at the end of it, of the conference, it ended. Nothing, no help for the uh, Holocaust victims, no help. We're not going to stop that. Listen to what Hitler said. Since in many countries it was recently regarded as wholly incomprehensible why Germany did not wish to preserve in its population an element like the Jews, it appears astounding that countries seem in no way anxious to make use of those elements themselves. Now that the opportunity affords. Okay, you guys, you won't take them. Then don't complain about what we're doing. April 1943, British and American officials met in Bermuda to discuss the Holocaust. It's grinding out its daily quota of slaughter of the Jews. What did the conclusion did they come to? The Americans and the British said, we're not gonna put pressure on Hitler because if we do, he'll disgorge them over to us and we do not want them. You understand, all the nations of this world are guilty before God. And God says, I'm gonna bring all the nations uh, against Jerusalem. And I'm going to plead with them there. I'm going to punish them there for what they've done. Now America has betrayed Israel many times. We give you the documentation. Um, USS Liberty. Uh, that was an American ship. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Uh, just to read it to you. 245. This is during the Six Day War. You've got this American ship, USS Liberty, hanging around just off the coast of Israel. What is it doing? Is it helping Israel? It's helping the Arabs. 
listen to how uh, Thomas, Admiral Thomas Moore described it as, quote, the most sophisticated intelligence ship in the world in 1967. It's just off the coast. It is picking up all of the Israeli military communications. It is relaying them to a giant uh, in British installation, electronic installation on Cyprus. They are turning it into maps, giving it to the Arabs. Israel can't allow that. That's suicide. Well, we send nine, eight or nine low level flights wiggling their wings. Hey guys, get out of here. You're not, <laughs> we wouldn't budge. So Israel just <laughs> took that ship out, took its communications out so they can't do their nefarious work any longer. Well, then you got a big blow up, go, go on the internet. According to Admiral Thomas Moore, fighter planes from two American air, aircraft carriers just a few minutes away by air were ordered into the sky to the rescue and called back by a direct order from the White House. Let me listen to what he says. Through direct intervention by the Johnson administration, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, cancellation of Navy's attempt to rescue the Liberty, which I confirmed from the commanders of the aircraft carriers of America and Saratoga, was the most disgraceful act I witnessed in my entire military career. You got a lot of military men on the internet, they're demanding, ought to be an investigation, a congressional investigation. No, America doesn't want a congressional investigation because Israel made this lame excuse. Oh, we're sorry, I mean, we thought it was a hostile Egyptian ship. You know that that's not true. Yeah, but America accepted it, why? Because they were caught betraying Israel. It's not the only time. Yom Kippur War in 1973. President Nixon, he had dispatch after dispatch from the National Security Administration. He knew when that war would break out and he would not tell Israel. Kissinger, Henry Kissinger hid out in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in, in New York for three days. He didn't want to call an emergency session of the United Nations to stop this. It was a slaughter, the closest Israel ever came to being wiped out. 500 defenders, Israeli defenders on the, on the line at the, at the Suez Canal were just wiped out by 80,000 Egyptian uh, invaders. It's the closest Israel came to being wiped out and we allowed it to happen. Well, Israel lost 3,000 men in that war. It's about the same number that we lost at the Twin Towers. I'm not trying to say there's some coordination, uh, but uh, there could very well be. We have betrayed Israel again and again and again. God is angry with America. Well, yes, America, but we, we've defended Israel and the UN. Yes, we have. It's a political matter, it's a military matter, and the military men could tell you. We need Israel. We need Israel as a buffer between us and the Arabs. But we also need the oil from the Arabs. So we play both sides. So we arm the Arabs, we arm the Israelis. Uh, it's a horrible situation. God says, I am angry with the nations of this world and I am going to punish them. I believe God is using terrorists to punish America and other nations for defying him concerning the land of Israel. We're getting what we asked for and Britain in particular is getting, it is reaping what it has sowed. Terrorism in England? They've been helping the Arabs. They gave the Arabs the Middle East, kept it away from the Israelis, gave it to the Arabs. Well, that doesn't mean anything. These people are not your friends. They never will be your friends. It's a business deal. It's a political deal. But they will turn on you as soon as they have the opportunity because Mohammed said, Islam must take over the world. You understand? Islam must take over the world. And they intend to do it. Now, you better wake up. Please. You understand? This is satanic. Satan must destroy Israel. And we are helping Satan do it. 
We are doing Satan's work for him. You understand what that means? The United States, once, well, almost a Christian country, we sent a lot of missionaries out there. We blessed a lot of countries. We blessed Israel. We've been their only friend in the UN. We are doing Satan's work for him. We are compromising Israel. We are betraying Israel. We are not being true to the word of God. Very clear what God says, that land belongs to my people. Leviticus 25, 23, God says, this is my land. It is not to be sold. It's not to be traded. And we are telling Israel, you got to trade it for peace. It's a, it's a lie. And God is angry. Judgment day for Islam and the nations, you better believe it. The God of Israel is not going to allow this to go on forever. And I will talk about it later. I think this day is getting very close when it's going to, he's going to, he's going to stop it. Father, you asked us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're not even sure what that means, Lord, because we know there will never be real peace until the Messiah comes to rule over Israel. But Father, we cry out to you. We cry out to you for the Muslims they've been lied to. They're held in bondage. We cry out to the Israelis that they might recognize who their Messiah is and they might turn to him. We pray that the gospel would get behind that Islamic curtain. We pray that many Muslims would turn to Christ as we know they are in some of the Muslim countries. And Lord, I pray for these dear people, dear friends who've come. God, help them not just to go home with some added knowledge, but Lord, help them to do something. Move their hearts to stop this lie, do everything they can to stop this lie, that Islam is peace. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.